we might be able to make an engine that instead of compressing a gas and expanding a gas, it would, in a sense, compress photons. Welcome to Nanomatters, the podcast that explores examples of nanotechnology. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Here with me today is Paul Elavisados, Vice Chancellor for Research and Distinguished Professor of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology at the University of California, Berkeley. Today, we're going to talk about his group's research in materials for renewable energy applications. So, Paul, what issues surrounding renewable energy are you working on? Well, first, thank you for having me today on the podcast. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to talk with you and to share our thoughts with the community. We're working on two things that I'm really uh, excited about right now. One of them concerns how we use light in energy conversion and renewable energy conversion. We are working on making quantum dot materials that can absorb high energy light and emit a a lower energy uh, light, and that will do that with an extremely high uh, efficiency to uh, almost every single time they're excited, they would then emit light. And let's say if they're excited a million times, they might only miss emitting a photon once. If we can make such a material, it can actually be used as part of a device that concentrates sunlight to a very high degree. And those can then be used, in a sense, they're like a gas compressor in a thermodynamic engine. So you might be able to make an engine that instead of compressing a gas and expanding a gas, it would, it would actually, in a sense, compress photons. So that's a really interesting idea that I'm excited about. And, um, very much relate to using light better uh, in solar energy. And a second idea we're working on um, is part of a large, large community effort that's been going on for a long time to try to uh, emulate photosynthesis and use sunlight in order to make and break bonds so that we could store energy in a, in a chemical bond and use it uh, that way. You mentioned the possibility of using these quantum dots or nanomaterials in in areas like solar energy. So what are some of the challenges in developing more efficient solar cells and what is the role of nanotechnology? I will say that we have some really good news in the world, just backing up a second to saying that I think solar technology that we have today with silicon solar cells has advanced so dramatically and the costs have dropped so much that we see that it's a growing business and and, and that's a wonderful thing. More and more energy is being harvested from the sun all over the world and that's a great thing for our environment. But it is true that for some time now people have known how to make solar cells that have much greater efficiency than those uh, silicon solar cells. And uh, so as a very practical matter, those tend to be way too costly. So one thing that nanoscience and nanotechnology may be able to do is to provide the facility, the ability to make solar cells at much lower cost that also match the performance of the kinds of solar cells that are often put on satellites, but which are so expensive that they, they can't really be used on a rooftop or in a, in a large solar installation for a utility. I, I do have to say, for my personal interest, is more focused, uh, as I kind of mentioned uh, earlier, in concepts that allow us to use solar, solar energy in different ways. So, for example, the idea of making a photon compression and expansion cycle using the photon gas as the analog of a gas in a conventional engine, that requires a lot of new science that we don't yet have. It's quite different than what would be done even in a very high efficiency solar cell today. And it requires the creation of materials that operate at the true limits of anything that we know how to do today. It requires a level of atomic precision in the fabrication of materials that is uh, really hard to do right now. But that's what makes it extremely interesting is to try to find a way to do that. So um, I think, you know, it's a very interesting situation. There's an existing technology and nanoscience can help to improve it. But also we should keep in mind that there may be 
just entirely new technologies that have not yet really been invented. And I think we have to balance those two out in our approach. So I, I wanted to pick up on some of your earlier comments where you talked about mimicking photosynthesis and the possibility of using solar energy and nanotechnology to store energy in chemical bonds. And I'm wondering if this is what sometimes people refer to as splitting water or as a source of renewable and clean hydrogen fuel. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. This is a really interesting area of development of chemistry and materials and, and even you know, the very basic physics. And certainly if we could take the energy of the sun and then make a chemical fuel with it, especially if it were liquid fuel, why then ultimately we could, uh, in a sense, close the carbon cycle. Imagine that we had made a hydrocarbon using carbon dioxide and water, which is what a plant, of course, does. You take the energy of the light and take carbon dioxide and water and make it into a reduced form of carbon that can then, can then be combusted. That could make a complete cycle of carbon. And that would, of course, succeed in altering the uh, unbalanced carbon cycle that, that people are um, involved in now when we, when we take uh, stored hydrocarbon fuels and burn them and then just leave the CO2 in the atmosphere. That has unbalanced our carbon cycle globally. So uh, chemically, if we could do that, that would be an enormous development. And looking outside my window and everything out there is green, these are all photosynthetic plants doing that. Yet if we try and do it in the laboratory in a way that emulates it, we still can't do it. So yes, in our case, we've been working, trying simply to split water, but to do both parts of, the, of that reaction, in other words, to produce both hydrogen and oxygen and have them occur at good rates when light is absorbed. And it turns out doing that in a very small collection of nanoparticles that are all kind of attached to each other, that would kind of emulate what goes on in a photosynthetic membrane with all of the chromophores and proteins and other things that, that are laid out just so. Well, that's still pretty hard to do. People can't quite do that. So that's what is a kind of a long-term challenge for us to learn to do. And uh, I'm optimistic. We're getting a lot better at this. When I say we, I mean a large community of scientists, but certainly in my research group, I feel like we're making good progress on it. And we're learning to do a lot more things than we knew how to even a year ago. Well, that's very exciting. And I appreciate the time you took today to talk about some of these applications of nanotechnology in renewable energy and want to ask if you have any additional thoughts that you would like to share with our listeners today. Well, maybe just to say that I think that nanoscience and nanotechnology are really at the core, at the foundation of how energy is converted from one form into another in, in so many ways. And to emphasize that we have some tremendous advances in renewable energy already, but more is possible. There's still things that we don't know how to do. And as our science and our technologies develop, we'll become more able. We didn't talk about this today, but I'm very, very hopeful that as time goes on, we'll learn how to recycle materials at the nanoscale in ways that mean that we create much less waste in the future.